Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in again to Lessons from the Playroom podcast. Um, Listeners, this is a really important conversation that we are about to have, and I am super excited to have Sue Ann Kinney Nozyska with us. She is, in my opinion, the expert in the field on um, working with children who have been sexually abused. And I am just, I'm so honored, first of all, Sue Ann, that you're here for this conversation. This um, topic, listeners, has been the most requested topic over the years. For those of you that have sent in emails, have sent in, we want to know more. And so to finally be able to, to, bring, um, to bring you to Ann feels like, a, just feels like a, a, a gift um, to be able to have this conversation for you and Suan with you. So for those of you that do not yet know Sue Ann, and you will hear um, very, very uh, clearly at the end of this conversation, let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a licensed clinical social worker. She's a registered play therapy supervisor. She specializes in work with abused and traumatized children, adolescents, and their families. She owns and operates her own private practice. You're in New Mexico, is that correct? Yes, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, and also part of her community's multiple, multidisciplinary team. Well, that's a mouthful of a word, isn't it? Um, on child abuse. Um, Sue Ann is inter- internationally recognized um, for her work. She has developed tons of trauma-informed interventions. She has testified as an expert witness. She's contributed to multiple publications on and on and on. She's trained professionals. And the first time that I saw Sue Ann was Sue Ann on the main stage keynoting the Association for Play Therapy Conference. And I went, wow, this woman is fantastic. So um, heads up for you uh, who are listening, who um, maybe want to bring training on this topic into your organization, or you're looking for a phenomenal keynote, uh, you're, you're about to have a conversation with someone right here. That's a great possibility. So Sue Ann, thank you again for, for joining and having this really important conversation with me. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm glad that we're discussing this because it's just such a heinous victimization for children. And we want to make sure that when we're interfacing and interacting with kids and teenagers that have been sexually abused, that we have good information, not just for our treatment, but good information to talk to the parents and the children and the teenagers about as well. Yeah, absolutely. Before we jump into this, the discussion on, on how to, or your advice or what to think about, tell us a little bit about how long have you been in, in practice and these children um, clearly grab your heartstrings in a pretty significant, in a pretty significant way. So maybe tell us a little bit about you and, and your, in your journey and, and why you love working with this population and why you've decided to to specialize this in our, in our field. So when I was getting my master's degree at San Diego state university, California's association for play therapy had their conference down at um, San Diego state. And I saw Janine Shelby present and I knew I was like, boom, that is it. That is what I want to do. And so I was exposed to her work and then got exposed to Ileana Gill's work and it led me to working for the Department of Mental Health in Southern California once I had graduated, 
and nobody wanted to work with little ones and nobody wanted to work with trauma. And so low man on a totem pole, (laughs) that was my case though, the young traumatized sexually abused kids. And I found my way to play therapy and have just been down here. Uh, I've had my private practice here since 2008 and have done this type of outpatient work since 1998. And it is a labor of love. There are days I feel like I'm beating my head on a wall. And then there's other days I'm like, yes, we had a breakthrough. So definitely a tough population. Yeah. I find that there are so many play therapists that are afraid to work with this, this population. I don't know if you find that also, but almost like the, not so much the fear of supporting the child, but the fear of supporting the child in the system and having to navigate the system and deal with the deal with the system. Uh, I'm curious if you experience that also, or if you find when you're doing trainings that, I don't know, maybe speak a little bit to what comes up in us as play therapists. When we think about, I've got a kid that's, that's been sexually abused on my caseload and normalize this a little bit for play therapists. I, I still will struggle with it. There's cases where I'm like, I feel like I'm treading very lightly, um, especially when kids are involved in the system and the multidisciplinary team that I'm on MDT, we are the decision makers of that system in the community of Las Cruces. So it's the district attorney's office, it's our law enforcement, it's child protective services, it's our children's advocacy, it's myself. And we're trying to minimize that trauma, but it's so difficult to maneuver those systems. I find in particular, my most challenging cases are cases involved with the legal system where there's a criminal uh, pending charge or a trial pending trial against the alleged offender. So then of course there's extra care in regard to working with that child. Is that child gonna have to testify What is that testimony going to look like? Um, And also in the CPS system where we have reunification, not necessarily between the offender of the sexual abuse and the child or teenager, but sometimes with the non-offending caregiver. So for ease of presentation, I'm going to refer to the offenders as males, to victims as females, and the non-offending caregiver would be the mom. And that, and we know that the opposite is true. We know that women also are offenders. Uh, males are also victims and non-offending caregivers can also be men. So, but it just for ease of presentation, but we'll often see situations where these non-offending caregivers, moms either should have reasonably known this was going on or they did know they had walked in on it or the kid had told them about it. Um, and the mom did not act in a protective way. And so when we're talking about reunifying victims with these non-offending caregivers, that can be a dicey system to maneuver as well. And then of course it impacts how directive I'm going to be, um, in the work that I'm doing, whether or not we can have a child that does a play narrative like a five-year-old through their play does a narrative, or they need to sit down and actually do a verbal, like that trauma narrative because they have to testify in court or because there's going to be reunification. And I still, even being in this field for 25 years and an expert, there are still cases, like I said, that I tread a little bit slower and easier with in regard to my play therapy approaches. Yeah. For me, you know, one of the, the, the pieces that I have found in my work that's been confusing are those times around role confusion between when the system wants me to be an investigator versus being the play therapist. Will you, I think that's an important distinction for play therapists to understand what their role is. Will you talk a little bit about what the role of the play therapist is when they're working with sexual abuse? Being very clear about our role is essential, not just to the therapy, but again, to that system. So we are not forensic, we are not fact-finding, and we are not investigative. Mm -hmm. 
Our job is to integrate that trauma and reduce any symptoms that are going on, whether that's anxiety or um, post-traumatic reactions or depression. So we need to be clear in particular with the other professionals involved with the case, but also with moms. It's not uncommon for me to have a, a child refer to me and for the parent or caregiver to say, I want to find out what happened to my child. Exactly. Well, yeah, we may never know exactly what did or didn't happen, but we can have healing through trauma-informed therapy, even if we don't get factual information from the child. Mm -hmm. So if a child ends up through some type of directive play-based intervention saying, I remember the abuse happening in the bedroom when there was blue carpet, it's not relevant to her healing, whether or not it, the carpet was really blue or not. Now, from an investigative standpoint, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Was there blue carpet in the room she's describing? Did she even live in that house during the time frame? But again, that's fact finding, that's investigative. So I'm very clear that that is not the role that I'm operating in. It's very standard for me to get releases up front to speak to law enforcement or the forensic interviewer and or the district attorney's office as more preemptive strikes so that I have full information when working with a child. But at the same time, it allows me to be clear what we do in therapy is not evidence of childhood sexual abuse. And on the flip side of that, Lisa, it's important for us to avoid situations where well-meaning professionals and or caregivers refer the child because they want us to find out if they've been sexually abused. They want it ruled in or out. Again, that's investigative. That's not the purpose of treatment. Yeah. I, th I think this um, is so huge for play therapists to, um, to understand uh, because I, I, at least I know in Colorado, this is where it, the, this is this area plus making referrals for suggested parenting time are two of the biggest sort of places where play therapists get caught and find themselves mm -hmm. in really hot water legally is putting on the investigator hat and then starting to make recommendations and not staying in their role of I'm here to help the 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 child heal. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you are reinforcing that we may not ever really fully know what happened, but that doesn't mean that healing still can't happen. Cause I think sometimes play therapists, we really want to know. And, and even if the system isn't saying you need to investigate, I think sometimes that can come up in the play therapist around, but I want to know, right. I, I want, I want to know, I want to make sense of this. I, and I, I just appreciate that you're really highlighting this as an important piece of, of the work that, um, yeah, when we're working with sexually abuse on our caseload, this is a, this is a really important piece. And I think it's particularly, at least for me as a clinician, it's particularly important because we have this emphasis on trauma narration, which we commonly associate with TFCBT. Like that is what we need to do is we need to help them narrate the trauma. Now, some of the current studies actually say, if you are trauma informed, you are doing types of trauma narration all throughout treatment. So if we're doing an activity, uh, a play-based intervention, and we're having a child share their feelings about the sexual abuse, that is a form of narrating that trauma. I felt confused. Um, I was really scared when I told that no one was going to believe me. That's part of their story. And we need to be able to hear that. And it doesn't have to be, it started when I was this old and it happened in this room and it happened this many times. And this is how I felt. We can do it piece by piece in a way that is also appropriate for the child or the teen. So they're not overwhelmed with um, processing their trauma and they don't shut down or prematurely in treatment. Yeah. So, Anne, what do you say when play therapists come up to you and say things like, what are the signs? I'm doing non-directive play. What are the signs in the room? What do I need to be looking for to, to indicate that there's been sexually abused? How do you, how do you work with that question when it's asked to you? 
Well, that's, again, it can be a very slippery slope. When I work with cases, I do not take cases where there hasn't been a disclosure. Now that doesn't mean it has to be prosecuted or CPS has to be involved, but if it means that the kid has to be saying this happened to me. So then I take what I know about dynamics of sexual abuse. And fortunately, we have at least in the US, we have a good two solid decades now of research and studies and meta-analysis on the impact of sexual abuse on the dynamics under which it occurs, such as grooming and secrecy and stigmatization and betrayal. Those are the things that I look for when I'm responding to a child's play. But I don't ever take, ooh, there's secrecy happening in the play, so therefore there's sexual abuse. Or um, they show the mom and the dad in the house and they're having sex. Therefore, there must have been sexual abuse. So again, it goes back to our earlier talking point of making sure we're clear with our role. I once received a phone call from a play therapist who wrote a letter, wrote a court report saying, I believe this child was sexually abused based on the following play themes. And the defense attorney filed a complaint against this therapist and it was a play therapist. And the play therapist reached out to me and said, what play themes do prove their sexual abuse? And I said, there's none. Exactly. Because we can get those same themes from a non-abused child as well. Yeah. Same thing with symptoms. There's no one clinical profile for victims. Yeah. And so we know that kids that have been sexually abused wet the bed and have nightmares and have regression. But we also know that kids that haven't been sexually abused can have nightmares and wet the bed and have regression. And so one doesn't equal the other. And being clear in that um, approach with systems and even the way we're viewing the play, making sure we're true to, we're here to reduce symptoms. Yeah, this conversation is so huge. Um, can I share a little a little play thing that that just even like highlights like what you're sharing that our listeners might appreciate hearing? Absolutely. So um, I uh, was working with a client, and in the play, the the client had taken some army men, and in the play, the army men were attacking each other, but they're the little plastic army men that are holding the you know holding the the, the, the guns, mm -hmm. and then was taking one of them and was um, like turned one around and seemingly like trying to look like it was jabbing the sword in the rear end of the, of this other figurine. Right. So just looking at this, you, if someone was, it had, was trying to be an investigator would go, Oh my gosh, what does that mean? Oh my gosh. This was, was this client like sexually abused? <gasps> right. You know, all of that. Um, well, it turns out that this child had a history of constipation and was often taken to the hospital and had enemas. And so I think that's just a, was a, it's a perfect example of if we just take play in this little tiny snapshot, we can make so much meaning out of it that may not that may not be there. And so I just, I so love what you are saying because I, I hear an invitation to take a larger view and to back, to, to, to back up and remind ourselves that we're here to help the child heal, not to interpret, not to hyper-focus on parts of the play, not to try to collect data, not try to, because there is so much anxiety in the system that makes us want to do that. So I just, I, I just am appreciating this message so very, so very much. Well, and that it's, it's interesting because we feel that even I think as a play therapist, not, I think, I know that I feel that internal pressure sometimes, but we get it from the moms. We get it from CPS. We get it from the judicial system. So this sort of this pressure, like, you know, find out what happened to the child and rule out sexual abuse or rule it in. And it's just such a slippery slope. We have to be very careful that we don't go down that, that, Avenue. Let's go actually into 
what we do know about sexually abuse a little bit more. Will you share with us a little bit what you know about some of the statistics and and just a, a little bit more about what some of the psychological effects are, just so in case our listeners aren't really fully familiar with that, that they can learn a little bit more. Absolutely. Our stats, and these are, I know that this podcast is international, so these stats are specific to the United States. Um, what our statistics suggest is that one out of every 10 children under the age of 18 will experience some type of sexual victimization prior to their 18th birthday. And when we look at who the offenders are, 90% of the victimization happens at the hands of someone that child knows and trusts. And only 10% happens at strangers, um, at the hands of strangers Those are the cases that are sensationalized by the news. Oh, you know, the homeless man in the bushes drinking the Colt 45, grab the child and rape them. And those are the minority. Those are the anomalies. 90% is somebody the child knows and trusts and has loyalty to. More specifically, if we look at that 90%, 60% are family members fathers, stepfathers, uncles, uh, teenage brothers, and 30% are neighbors, teachers, coaches, clergy people, scout leaders, etc. It's one of the reasons that it's so difficult to disclose sexual abuse, because it's not the stranger, it is my grandpa. And he has two roles in my life. He's the one that remembers my birthday. He helps mom pay her rent. He always makes sure that I have a new dress for my school pictures, but he's doing something that he's not supposed to be doing to me. But I love him and I don't want him to get in trouble. And if I tell, I'm not sure if people are going to believe me. And so these offenders take on this dual role, which creates so much confusion and loyalty conflicts in children and teenagers in terms of disclosing. Um, Sometimes the abuse starts when kids are so young that they don't even realize it's not supposed to happen. They don't realize until they're school age. And we have those Um, We call them prevention programs, but I like to think of them more as early intervention. The program that goes into the school and the puppets talk about safe and unsafe touches. And they have the kids draw a picture of a safe person that they can talk to. Um, And it can be in that moment that a victim goes, oh my gosh, grandpa's not supposed to be doing that. I thought that's what happened in families. Um, When we look at the grooming dynamics, sexual abuse has a very insidious onset. And it's, and I use this metaphor a lot. Kids get sexually abused much in the same way where, whereby we gain weight. I am not going to wake up tomorrow and be 20 pounds heavier. That's just not going to happen, but it's possible with the holidays and with the new year coming up and et cetera, et cetera. It's possible in six months eight months that I've gained 20 pounds. And it's like that with this grooming for sexual abuse. It starts out with this. It can be something as benign as before I take you to school, we're going to go grab donuts, but don't tell mom it's our special secret. And then it's the extra long hug, or it's the tickling that goes awry and they brush against the child's breast. It's the, we're watching a movie and I'm rubbing the child's leg. And now I go closer and closer to her vaginal area. So the abuse happens long before the first actual sexual contact. And so then kids find themselves thinking, well, how did this happen? And this must be my fault because I didn't stop it or I didn't tell right away. So we know that there's a grooming process to victimizations. We also know now that disclosure is a process. Kids generally do not sit down and just give a one story beginning, middle and end of this is what's been happening. A lot of times, not only does it gradually fold out, but it happens in hints. So for example, a child might say to their mom, 
you know, I watched this movie and in the movie, this girl's private parts were being touched. And the mom's like, oh, well, you should be watching those types of nasty movies. So now the kid knows I'm not telling mom. So then she says something to grandma, like, um, you know, I had a dream that uncle Johnny was touching my private parts and grandma's like, child, you need to get to church more. Those are sinful thoughts. So now I can't tell mom and I can't tell grandma. So I give a hint to my aunt and I say, you know, I have this friend and she told me that someone's touching her private parts. And the aunt says, oh my gosh, that's terrible. It's not her fault. We need to make sure this stops. Now the child knows, here's who I'm going to disclose to. If we even get to disclosure, uh, which doesn't happen nearly as often as it should, and I'll talk about that in a second, that disclosure is delayed. And then just by the way that child gives hints, it looks like the child is lying. They're not credible. So the child finally says to the aunt, you know, I told you it was my friend, but really it's me. So the aunt calls the mom and the grandma and she's saying, Uncle Johnny did this to to her. And mom says, well, no, she told me that it was a movie. And grandma says, well, she told me it was a dream. And so just the way the disclosure happens makes it look like this couldn't have really happened because her story is not straight. And in essence, that's truly understanding how disclosures happen. There's studies that actually kind of have teased out some of the facilitators and barriers to disclosure. And one of them is age. We're more likely to get a disclosure the older someone gets. And that includes into adulthood. There was a study, and I want to say it was out of Switzerland or Sweden, and it looked at disclosures of childhood sexual abuse, and it had a sample size of a thousand adults. And the average age at which these victims told about their sexual abuse was 52 years of age, Wow! which means they've gone their entire life up until adulthood without being able to say, Hey, this happened to me Wow! without having somebody say, I believe you and I'm sorry. And it isn't your fault. Mm -hmm. So that's how powerful these dynamics are. So when we have a child or a teenager in our office and they have found it within themselves and through their support system to be able to say, this is happening embrace that and accept that disclosure and say the things that they deserve to hear. I believe you. I'm going to take steps to protect you. Thank you for trusting me and telling me this is absolutely not your fault. And you are courageous for telling. So, so powerful. Yeah. It makes me think also of the education that's needed for parents just around how to hold conversations that have um, a sexual component to them and how, and how do, how do parents talk about sexuality and talk about sex and things that happened in sexual context in a way that, um, that allows for more openness of possibility for, asking of questions or like you said, dropping hints. Um, It's so it's kids are so brilliant, aren't they? Just testing the water here and there and who can hold this and who's not going to shame me and who's gonna kids are so dang brilliant. So dang. Yes. Yes. And you're hitting on a point that the studies have actually suggested disclosures of abuse happen in the context of a relationship and a dialogue. So if we have adults, whether it's the mom or the aunt or the teacher or the best friend's mom that asks a child about their welfare, how are things going? Even if it's, even if the child is seemingly doing well, in particular, if a child isn't doing well, Hey, I noticed that you've seen kind of, kind of sad lately. Is everything okay? If we check in on kids' welfare, we are allowing them, inviting them to say, hey, I'm not okay. This bad thing is happening to me. 
So that relationship and that open dialogue is crucial to having these kids and teenagers be able to disclose their sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. As we um, are just moving through this really beautiful conversation, when the question I think I want to just keep coming back to is, gosh, I'm imagining a, a play therapist hearing this. I'm imagining that this is providing some insight and some, some uh, clarity for them in their own approach and their own, you know, uh, work with kids. And then I'm also holding this piece that we talked about at the very beginning of how hard this work is and how, how emotionally taxing it is for a, for a play therapist, because it is so complex and there are so many pieces to hold. And I, and I want to ask you, how does the play therapist support him or herself? Like what, what does the play therapist need to do within themselves to be able to navigate all this? Cause it's so much, it's so big. Boy, there's so many layers to that question. And I think we are much better as a profession about talking about secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, things that we didn't talk about in my graduate program back in 1996 and 98. It was believed that um, if you had countertransference reactions, that that meant you weren't doing a good job. And now we know if you're not having countertransference, there's something wrong. If you can hear these stories and not have something in you go, oh, that strikes a chord for me, or I'm not sleeping well at night, or I know it's affecting uh, my relationships with my significant other. If we're not aware of that and we're just shutting it down, that's where we start to see burnout. I think we have a lot of good things in the field. We have more workshops uh, normalizing these reactions. We have more of a of a dialogue going on. I know there's retreats going on. I believe uh, you and Claire Mellington and uh, Jen Taylor are doing something in San Diego that's sort of like a rejuvenation um, for therapists. So I think these types of things are are very valuable. Our uh, support system, making sure we use that support system, whether that's not working in isolation uh, or making sure that we spend time with our BFF or we're doing things that remind us life isn't all about trauma. Because when you're working with trauma, it's easy to now everything is this lens of sexual abuse, victimization, betrayal, powerlessness. And that can take over if we're not, again, really being honest with ourselves, getting supervision, getting con consultation, uh, working with the team, using our support system, and also working through our own traumatic issues. A lot of people are in this field because we have a history of trauma. And so if you have a history of sexual trauma and then you're working with abuse and traumatized children, it's really important that you've done your own work. And even if you've done your own work, Lisa, you may reach a time in your career where you need to revisit that work because totally. something else is coming up for you. Totally. totally. So keeping that door open and realizing that's how you persevere through working with this particular uh, population. Yeah. I, um, I just want to appreciate something that I heard that I heard you say that I, I, I actually haven't heard someone say before, but it is so true, which is that when we have a high trauma caseload, that that begins to filter into how we see the world at large mm -hmm. and how we can start to sometimes even have a skewed sense of humanity. I've, I've seen that, that come up, a skewed sense of, of reality sometimes. Uh, looking for warning signs, how we can start to almost carry the sense of trauma ourselves as we're moving through the world, uh, the hypervigilance, the anxiety ourselves. And I just, I really appreciate that you've, you've named that. I imagine that just normalize that just normalize something for someone that was, that's listening here. And then how important it is to um, do things to remind ourselves that that's a, that's a part of, 
the human experience. It's not the totality of the human experience. Yes. That's a good way to phrase that, but it does, it it changes our worldview. And that's because we're human. And when we are exposed to human suffering, it's, it's going to shift our, our perceptions, our, our paradigm understanding of the world. And there's some information out there that suggests as play therapists, and when we're working with children, we're even more susceptible to these things like compassion fatigue and burnout and secondary traumatic stress, because we see um, symbols and metaphors and sand trays and play themes that are graphic in nature. And so again, we could be even more susceptible than therapists who are using traditional talk therapy and aren't using play and art and sand the way we use them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the things that I have that I feel like is a unique thing about a play therapist compared to someone who's just doing traditional talk therapy is that we are, we're activating all of our senses in the, in the process, including kinesthetic. If we're actually in the play Mm -hmm. or we're, we're engaging that piece um, in a more like embodied way, which isn't something that happens when we're just doing traditional talk therapy, where yes, we have the visual, yes, we have the auditory, but we can stay a little bit more removed. But when you're in the play, you're in the play and you're, you're in the play on, on all, on all, on all levels and how, how, much further, I think that the play then lands inside of us because our buffers um, aren't, well, it's a different kind of a buffering system when you're in it versus yeah. listening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and I feel like I could just talk to you um, for hours and hours um, about this. I want to reiterate listeners, this is such an important topic and I am serious. If you are part of an organization, if you have a conference, um, if you want more education about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious listeners, I, I want you to reach out to, to Sue Ann and, uh, and ask for her s- uh, support. She knows what she's talking about. And this is a piece of education that's really important that we all, that we all get because we don't, we don't learn about this in graduate school and we don't, we don't go into it at the level that we need to go into it. So, and as we're wrapping up, what's, what's your big advice for play therapists who are working with sexual abuse? I think my biggest piece of advice is don't let there be a disconnect between the play and what the, what the literature is telling us. Turn to that literature, turn to those studies, turn to those meta-analysis and use that as a way of understanding kids play and how they disclose their sexual abuse and why it may be that their story doesn't make sense because it's a trauma story and not a factual story. So really allow the literature to inform the play and don't disconnect those two things. That would be my biggest piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Sven, thank you once again. Um, I, before we jumped on this, I had shared, I felt like this conversation was a long time coming. As I also shared, this has been the, the, the topic that's been most requested over the years. And I have been waiting for the right person to come on and offer this, this, uh, this level of education. And I'm grateful it's you. And I'm grateful that you're, you're sharing this and out there being an advocate for kids because, well, they, I'm grateful you're on the planet. That's what I want to say, Sue Ann. I'm really grateful you. you're on this planet. <laughs> and I appreciate you and what you're doing. <laughs> I appreciate you having me and rec- what an important conversation this is to have, um, especially for those of us in the field that are working or could pen- potentially be working at some point in our career with victims of sexual trauma. So thank you. It's yeah. my pleasure to be a part of it. Yeah, thanks, Sue Ann. Okay, listeners, hopefully that this is just the beginning of a larger um, exploration for you. Hopefully it's the beginning of um, more education and training for you and that some uh, insights, questions got sparked. And uh, wherever you are in the world, um, I invite you to take a deep breath 
if you are someone that does have sexual abuse on your caseload, I invite you to take an even deeper breath and um, all of you be well, take care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in that playroom. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.